Have a seat. Well, good morning, everybody. Glad that you are here this morning with us. I, I noticed the ratio of men to women is a little skewed this morning. All the men are at the men's conference at the R Ranch. I was there yesterday, and it was such a blessing to be with, uh, with all the men um, and to hear the word of God being taught um, and uh, just to see so many men together in one place focusing on, um, on studying the word of God. And with that said, um, I'm going to follow a, a similar theme from what was said yesterday. Um, Pastor Jeff yesterday talked about priorities and how we need to reset our priorities. That was the theme of the conference. And I talked about inductive Bible study and how we need to be diligent, right, to study the Word of God. And one of the verses that I used was in Ezra. So today, I'm going to also go through this, that one verse, but to give you a little bit of context, I'm going to read the, the nine verses before that. So go with me to Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. Pastor Jeff is going through Ezra right now with you, and he's talking about restoration. And, and Ezra is such an encouraging book. Ezra and Nehemiah in the Jewish Bible actually are one book. And Ezra chapter 1 to 6 is about the rebuilding of the temple and the altar with Zerubbabel. In verses, I'm sorry, in chapter 7 to 10, it's about rebuilding the people and the revival that happened. But what was the precursor to the rebuilding of the people and the revival and the reformation and the repentance that happened during that time? It was the verse that we're going to talk about today, how God used Ezra to do that. Um, in Nehemiah, which, like I said, this is really part of the same book in the Jewish Bible, then it talks about the rebuilding of the walls. And Pastor Jeff also talked about yesterday about how rebuilding the walls in our lives, how these walls can be torn down. But in order for us to rebuild them, we have to reset our priorities, and we have to make the Word of God a paramount priority in our life. We need to make um, our faith, we need to take our faith seriously, okay? So as, you, as Pastor Jeff has been going with you, the, the timeline of this book is, um, in, cha in Ezra chapter 1, is about 70 years after the children of Israel were taken into the exile in Babylon. So God, when God gave the Mosaic law to the Jewish nation, he told them, if you obey my law, I'll bless you. If you disobey my law, I will curse you. And he gave them a specific commandments they had to follow. But instead, they kept um, worshiping idols, and they kept disobeying God for 490 years. And one of the things that they also disobey is that they did not let the land live fallow for a year. So every seven years, they were supposed to not plant and not harvest and just trust God that he was going to provide for them in the sixth year enough for two years, but they didn't do it. So what does God say? They said, he was, you are going to be a year in exile for every year in those 490 years, every seven years, that will add up to 70. Seven times 70 is 490. So 70 years you are going to be in Babylon. But Jeremiah prophesied and he said, but you will come back. You will come. God is going to bring you back. So that's in Ezra chapter 1. And that's when Zerubbabel went back. And that's when Zerubbabel um, rebuilt the temple and rebuilt the altar, of course, with a lot of challenges. So now go with me now with, to Ezra chapter 7. This is about 58 to 60 years after Zerubbabel. So when it said in Ezra chapter 7, verse 1, when it says now, that's 58 years from chapter 6. Okay? So it says, now after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Seraiah, the son of Azariah, 
the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Mariath, the son of um, Zariah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abishio, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the high priest. Isn't it interesting how God is so interested in genealogy? How many of you, when you, when you come to a chapter and there is long genealogy, you just go and you skip to the end? Don't raise your hand between you and the Lord, right? Were you making fun of me when I was reading those names? I probably butchered some of those names, but that's okay. You know why it's important that the names are important to God? Because God, in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned and they listened to the voice of the serpent, which has been trying to corrupt the word of God since then, what did God say to, um, um, to the serpent? He said, he said, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. You are going to bruise your heel. That was a reference to Jesus dying on the cross, but the, the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. That's when Jesus was going to defeat sin and death and is going to rise on the third day. And all of that, all of that genealogy, all of that, we can track the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Adam. Name after name after name after name. So when Ezra realized that the temple of God was rebuilt, he realized that he had to go back and help. Why? Because God has chosen Israel to bring the Messiah through. I have a Jewish neighbor. He thinks I'm, I get offended if he says that the Jewish people are God's chosen people. I said, no, 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 you are God's chosen people, but chosen for what? Do you know what you were chosen for? He doesn't know. I'm like, you were chosen to bring the Messiah, my Jesus, my King. That's why you were chosen for. I have no problem as an Arab saying that God chosen the Jewish people because God brought through them my Savior. And, and Ezra, as a, as a descendant of Aaron, the high priest, and we're going to see also he was a, a skilled scribe. He would have known that, that's, that Israel was chosen to bless all the nation, that through them was going to come the Messiah. And now that the temple was established back again, he knew he needed to go back and help do all of that. So, in, in verse 6, it says, So Ezra came from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. We're going to see, you, you will see when Pastor Jeff will go through this in the rest of chapter 7, how even Artaxerxes, a pagan, a pagan king, commands the, a scribe, a priest of the nation of Israel to go back and teach the law of his God to his people. Isn't that awesome how God uses everything? Sometimes, right now, you probably are disturbed by all that's happening in our country. The election. Maybe you voted on this side. Maybe you voted on this side. And now they're going through litigation and everything is uncertain. A few months ago, we had riots and looting and burning of buildings. And, and we've been going through COVID, right? Um, somebody told me um, uh, last week, he said, oh, I miss the America that I grew up in. I didn't grow up in America. So I told him, I said, I miss the America of 2019. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, but do you think any of this happened outside of God's control? God is working all of his purposes. That he even used Xerxes, a pagan king, to restore the nation of Israel, to restore the temple, to, 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 to ask a scribe and a, a priest of the nation of Israel to go back and teach the law 
back to his people. So um, the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. It was according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. God was orchestrating all of this. God was working through Ezra. God was stirring God's, uh, uh, Ezra's heart to do this. So um, in verse 7, it says, uh, Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nathanaeum uh, came to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. On the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Again. So, Ezra was going to teach a Bible study. He was going to teach the law to his people in, in Israel. You know how long he had to, to travel to do that? About a thousand miles. Has any of you traveled a thousand miles to teach Bible study? Jessica? <laughs> Isn't that interesting how, much, how hard he worked? And he would have had to go through a very dangerous times. But you will see um, in the rest of the chapter that he did not want to ask from protection from the king because he was ashamed. So he just kept, they prayed and fasted so God will protect them on the way. But now here is the verse that I want to discuss today. In verse 10, it says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statues and ordinances in, in Israel. There is four verbs here. Prepared, his heart. Seek or study the law of the Lord. And to, to do it, meaning the law. And to teach statues. Now, there might be two groups among you today. Those who say, I want to teach. And those of you who say, I don't want to teach. But guess what? Either way, you are a teacher. You're a teacher to your children. Maybe you're a teacher to your wife. You're a teacher to those among you. You are an example. You are teaching by the way you live your life. You are a teacher to someone, your classmates, your coworkers. So, what do you do to teach God's law? The first thing you have to do is prepare your heart. Prepare your heart. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Guard your heart above all else. Keep your heart above all else. Why? Because from it springs the issue of life. Everything in your life, everything that you do is coming out of your heart. Your heart is not referring here to the lung that is pumping blood. It's referring to the spiritual muscle that pumps spiritual blood into everything that you do. So, this is what I told the men yesterday. Because I taught about inductive Bible study. And inductive Bible study is a very methodical, step-by-step, um, it could be very rigorous. It could also be sometimes um, a little hard because you have to know a lot of grammar. You have to know history. You have to know culture. And, and here's what I said. I said, none of that matter if your heart is not in the right place. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to teach? Why do you want to know the law? Do you want to know the law so that you can do it? Are you studying the law so that you can do it? That is the first thing. That should be your goal. Not information, but transformation. Not information, but transformation. Knowledge puffs up, it says in Corinthians, but love edifies. Love for the people. I must learn it so that I can do it. And if my heart is not in the right place, I want to learn it so I can show people that I learn, I know it. Not because I want to do it myself. And what, would, what did Jesus call people who did that in his time? He called them hypocrites. 
He said, hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs. You are look good on the outside, but on the inside you are filled with dead men's bone and everything that stinks. That's how basically you can translate it. They stunk on the inside. If you know the, words God, the word of God, but you are just learning it so that you can show people that you learn it and so that you can look good on the outside, then God condemns you. God rejects you, right? Keep your heart, guard your heart above all else from. From it springs all the issues of life. So that's what Ezra did. The first thing he did, he prepared his heart. I need to go before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I confess my sin to you. Search my heart, Lord. I want to live a life that's pleasing to you. Right? Because the word of God is profitable for teaching, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be equipped, thoroughly equipped, ready, skilled for every good work. For every good work. You want to do a good work? You want to do a good work as a husband? as a wife, as a father, as a mother, then what do you have to do? You need to be skilled in instructions and righteousness. You need the word of God. Nothing else is going to prepare you to do a good work. You have to be thoroughly equipped. You have to go to the word of God with humility, seeking him. That's another part thing of preparing your heart. If there is no humility, your heart is not ready. You're not ready to receive instructions. If Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God, the spotless, perfect Lamb of God, it said in Philippians, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself and took on the form of a bondservant. If Christ God became a servant to you and me and died on the cross for my sin and your sin, how much more should you and I humble ourselves before God? There should be no pride. Otherwise, your heart is not ready. You cannot know the word of God if you are prideful. It's always interesting to me when I see supposed scholar in New Testament studies. Went to Moody, went to Wheaton, went to Princeton, but now he's an atheist and agnostics, an agnostic, and he teaches people why the Bible is not something to believe in. Why? Because his heart was not ready. Yes, he was, he was studying, but it was up here. It wasn't in his heart. And he was seeking knowledge. He was seeking information. He was not humbling himself before his God. So prepare your heart. Um, in 2 Timothy, um, the King James translated study, but it actually means to be diligent. That tells you, students, are you listening? You, the word student means diligence. So if you're not diligent, you're not a student, right? That's where the word study came to us in English. It means diligent. It says, be diligent, study to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. I submit to you this morning, you cannot rightly divide the word of God if your heart is not ready. You need to know the Lord first. If you don't know the Lord this morning, the first thing you need to do is go before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need you. I need to be saved. Trust I trust in you. Change my heart. I want to be completely surrendered to you. But then after that, you humble yourself. And you go to the word of God with a sense of humility, willing to receive what the word of God is ready to say to you. Because the word of God is, is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, and the discerner and the, of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's from Hebrew chapter 4, verse 12. So 
the Word of God has an amazing way, if you are willing, to completely look at you and examine you and go straight to the heart of the matter and show you where you need to change, where you need to be transformed, where you need to surrender, where you need to say, Lord, I want to be completely sold out to you. I'm not going to hold anything back. That is the word of God. In, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, um, also, Paul calls it there, the sword of the spirit. It's, if, you, if you looked at the, the, ar- the armor of God, it's interesting that that is the only offensive weapon. All the other weapons are defensive. The helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, right? But the sword is an offensive weapon. Not only can you use it to examine your heart, but you can also use it to teach, reprove, correct, and instruct in righteousness. So that was the first thing. He prepared his heart. But then he studied. He sought the law of the Lord. That was an intentional effort. You cannot just go to the Word of God and just read it, yawn a little bit, close the Bible, and then pray. That is not how it works. It's not going to just supernaturally change you if you are not willing to. The Word of God is powerful, but there is also an element of your will, an element of your volition to say, Lord, I want to hear from you. Show me your law. Open my eyes to see wonderful things from your law. That is the word of God. So I need to go to it with intentionality. I need to study it. When you guys are, uh, when I was here, um, we used to do discipleship one on one, and you guys are still doing that, right? In the discipleship, remember we used to we used to say there was five things you need to do about the word of God: read it, hear it, memorize it, right? But then also, you need to study it. Studying is hard. Remember, that word study in English comes to us to mean diligent. Be diligent. You need to be diligent. You you need to go to the Word of God um, with, uh, with time. Give it time. Read it. Read it again. Read it again and again. Read it patiently. Sometimes I read a passage 50 times before I teach it, 50 times. And actually, I still feel inadequate because, you know, in the Old Testament and during Jesus' time, you were not allowed to teach the, the, the Word of God unless you memorized it. You had to memorize it before you can teach it. If you didn't memorize it, you were not qualified to teach it. So I, I need to go to the Word of God with seriousness and give it, the respect that is due, give it the attention that it's due, and go there with full heart, with my heart prepared. So study it. I need to study the Word of God. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, after that, what do you do? Once you study the Word of God, and, and now you know the Word of God, then what did Ezra do? He did it. He do it. Once you know the word of God and you don't do it, you know now what you are? You're a hypocrite. And you have a greater condemnation. Right? Because now you know better. So now there's a responsibility on you now that you know what it says. So don't go to the word of And God may not even reveal it to you unless you are willing to do it. So if you are reading and not understanding, maybe because you have already determined that you are going to do what you want to do. And that's why God is not showing it to you. So you have to walk it out. You have to live it. Because we don't want to be like the Pharisees, right? Um, Go with me to to Psalm chapter 1. So if you're in Ezra, if you go to, um, to your right, a couple of books. Go to Psalm chapter 1. Look what it says. 
in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, blessed is the man or woman who walks not in the counsel of an ungodly. That's part of preparing your heart. If you are choosing to walk with the ungodly, not necessarily that there are ungodly people around you, but you're choosing to partner with them. You're choosing to agree to what they're doing, and you're choosing to befriend that. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Day and night, God told the, Isra uh, the Israelites to teach it to the children, to, to put it on for their forehead, to put it on the doorpost. They were to be engrossed in the word of God. He meditates on it day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, who, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. You want to prosper in everything that you do? Study the word of God. Meditate on the word of God and do it. And God will prosper you. You know why? Because God's going to change your heart. Your desires is going to be for the, desire, for the words of God, for the things of God, for God's purposes. But if you do like the children of Israel who choose to rebel against God for 490 years and not do his law, you know what's going to happen? Then you are going to feel like you're in exile in Babylon. And you're going to feel persecuted, and you're going to feel oppressed, and you're going to feel depressed. And you're going to have regrets. But instead, go to the word of God. Meditate on it day and night, and God will prosper everything that you do. Go, go also to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Look at verses, look, look at verse 1. It said, blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walks in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. Again, the heart, the heart. Verse 3, they also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. They have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. You have commanded us to keep your precept diligently. Oh, that my ways were direct, directed to keep your statues. Then I would not be ashamed. When I look into all your commandments, I will praise you with uprightness of heart. When I learn your righteous judgment, I will keep your statues. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. How can a young man cleanse his way? Listen, young man. How do you cleanse your way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart, oh, let me might not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Do you want to get rid of sin in your life? Do you not want to sin against God? Hide his word in your heart. I grew up in a Christian home. And I knew the word of God. You know, um, for you women who think you are not teachers, I give you two examples, actually three. One is the grandmother of Timothy, Lewis. The mother of Timothy, Unis. What did Paul tell them? He said that your grandmother and your mother, they were the one that have started that faith in you. I'll give you a third example, my mother. When I was young, when, since we were kids, I still remember her bringing us all together and we would read the Bible and we would memorize the Bible. But there was a time in my life when I strayed during college. For a couple of years, I wanted to do my own thing. But you know what? I did not stray far because every time someone would tempt me to do something wrong, the word of God that was hidden in my heart was like a guardrail. I did not go too far. I knew that was a line I should not cross. And God protected me from so many things. So you as a mother, as a father, 
as an older brother, as an older sister, you should be teaching the word of God to your children. Let them hide it in their heart. That's why we, we, you do Awana here still, right? And they are still, your children are memorizing the word of God. This would be a guardrail for them when they grow up. So they would not stray. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Um, go also with me to verse 105. Um, chapter 19 of Psalm is very long. So go to verse 105. So you're going to have to flip a couple of pages to the right. Verse 105 of Psalm 119, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Do you feel like you're walking in darkness? You don't know what to do? You need a lamp to show you the way. At that time, they didn't have flashlights. So they will take a lamp and they will put it in front of them so they can don't stumble, so they don't fall into a ditch. And that's what the word of God is to you. It's a lamp to your feet so that you know where to walk in this life. Um, So... Ezra, he prepared his heart, he studied the law, he sought the, 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 the law of the Lord, and then he did it. He did it. Before he taught it, you do it. You cannot teach your children, you cannot teach your wife, you cannot teach others around you if you are not doing it. Right? You're going to teach people around you more by what you do than by what you say. Jesus told the disciple, he said, do what they say, don't do what they do. Because the Pharisees were a stumbling block to others. But we don't want to be a stumbling block. So the first thing you need to do, after you studied it, you need to do it. But then you need to teach it. Um, So uh, teaching is hard. It puts you in the spotlight. But at the same time, what is better thing that you can do with your life, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, you don't have to be in the pulpit to be a teacher. You don't have to be Jessica. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher. Every one of you is a teacher. Even the four-year-olds and the five-year-old, you are a teacher to somebody, right? So make sure that what you're teaching And what you're communicating in your life is something that honors God, that edifies God, that brings glory to God's name. So do you know what happened after Ezra did all of this? There was a huge revival. People repented from their sin. People um, turned away from their idolatry. And God used Ezra mightily. Ezra, of course, wrote this book. He wrote Ezra and Nehemiah. Of course, the first, like I said, the first six six chapters were before his time, but he used the records to write that and to bring it all together. But you know what else? Some scholars think he also wrote 1 and 2 Chronicles. And also people think that he was the one that put the Jewish Bible in the order that it is right now. So God used him in a great way to restore the people, to bring the law back to, to, to Israel so that God can can continue to preserve that nation to bring the Messiah. So I pray that that's what all of you will decide to say, that this morning you'll say, I am going to prepare my heart to study God's law. I know that's going to be hard. Sometimes I'm not going to understand it. I may have to go to Pastor Jeff. I have to go to Jessica. I have to seek it. I need to be diligent, but then I'm going to do it. I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to live in righteousness. I'm going to live in purity. I'm going to live in holiness. I'm going to live out in complete obedience to my God. I'm going to take my faith seriously. And then I'm going to teach it in whatever capacity, in whatever opportunity that God gives me. Whoever God puts in my way, I'm going to teach his law. Because that's the only thing that is going to save us. That's the only thing. It's God's law. Let it be 
a lamp to our feet. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Because your word is, is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it discerns the intents of our heart. I pray, Father, that the intents of our hearts this morning is not to be comfortable. Is not to seek our comfort. Is not to seek our lust. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. The pride of life. Is not to seek our way. Not to seek our will. But to say, Lord, thy will be done. Thy will be done in my life. That will be done in, in my family, in my work, in my school, and in everything that I do. We thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we can still be in a country where we can come and meet here so freely and talk about your word. We pray, Father, for our country. We just pray that you will give us restful days, give us peaceful days. Bring, Father, um, peace into our country. But also we pray, Lord, for our church. Thank you, Father, for River Rock Church. Thank you for all that you're doing here. Thank you for Pastor Jeff. Thank you, Father, for these men who are taking time to go and, and listen and study. Thank you, Father, for Jessica and what you're using her, Father, to teach the women here. I just pray, Lord, that this church will continue to be a city on a hill, Father, a light to this community, a blessing to this community. I pray, Father, that everyone here will be a blessing to those around them at work, at school, and everything that they do. I pray, Lord, that all of them will prepare their heart to study the law of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.